Well, I'm, um, I'm happy about three things this afternoon. I'm happy to be at this conference. I appreciate that. I'm happy I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> I expect you're real happy I only have 10 minutes. And, and I'm also really happy that there's an evaluation form. Well, actually, I'm really happy there's an evaluation form and you didn't give me an hour to talk. So, so re recently, I, w I gave a talk and, and uh, they, they handed out the evaluation forms, and then I got to look at them later, you know, how you get to do as the speaker. And, you know, it has those little checks at the beginning and the numbers and everything, and then they have these comments at the bottom, right? So I was sort of flipping through them, and I saw one, and it said, if I had one hour left to live, I'd want to listen to Dr. Weed. My, my, gra you know, my grandma would say, bestill my heart. <laughs> and, and then I turned it over and it said, because only Dr. Weed can make an hour seem like an eternity. <laughs> so, let's, uh, let, let's, let, uh, you, that's, that's a keeper, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, uh, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis that we've just completed. Uh, oh yeah, you know, I was a little uh, confused about this, about the program and everything. I mean, these are some of the commercial interests. I mean, I've, I was at the National Cancer Institute for 25 years, and then I left and I set up a consulting business, so of course I have all sorts of folks who have very kindly provided funding for me to do research projects and consulting and legal work. Um, these are just some of them. And this project was funded by the Coca-Cola company. And we've all received funding from them. And I actually think this is a pretty effective way to mitigate potential bias when you're working with industry. We have a contractual agreement that we have full and final control over the design, the results, the analysis, and the interpretation of the research. A contractual agreement. So let's talk about meta-analysis. You probably know a little bit about what that is. Some of you know a lot about it. It is a method for summarizing and combining results across scientific studies. It's an interesting methodology because it didn't exist until about the mid-1980s. And you can appreciate that since that time, it has taken off in terms of its uh, popularity and its importance. I, I like to put this slide up because I want to keep you folks, and you probably know this, that it alone is not a particularly effective method for, for example, determining causality. And causality is what I've been writing about for about 30 some years now. It is one of a variety of methods that you use. So I were talking about this with some folks at lunch, that if you were to ask me, what is the methodology that you use to decide whether or not something causes something, the answer isn't meta-analysis. The answer isn't randomized clinical trials. The answer is a whole family of methods that you use in order to effectively evaluate and assess a body of evidence to determine or establish causation. And we're not going to go through all this because we don't really have time, but I just wanted to sort of put this into context. And meta-analysis and pooled analysis, which is very similar, really has three functions, as you probably know. It has the weighted average of the observed effect measure. So you have a group of studies, and you're trying to figure out what is the overall average effect measure or average effect of those studies. It's also an assessment of heterogeneity, which is a a, and there are two types, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, and it's also an assessment of publication bias. So meta-analysis does three things, not just one. And that just says the same thing um, with some more words. So 
And I'm, I'm going to go through this very quickly, so, and then we will sit down and you can ask questions. So we did a systematic search of the literature for studies, prospective epidemiology studies on this putative association between, we'll call them artificially sweetened beverages, some people call them low calorie sweetened beverages, some people call them no calorie, whatever. This is language that has been used for some time. Uh, we're going to combine that data using random effects meta-analysis. We evaluated confounding and identified the confounders in those studies a priori. As you can see here, we calculated summary relative risks and the 95% confidence intervals. And then we assessed dose response using the actual consumption data. That is, we used the serving data and did not transform that serving data into grams uh, 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 consumed per day. And then we assess publication bias, both qualitatively and quantitatively. I mean, this is just sort of how you do meta-analysis. You probably all know this, but that's what we did. And here's what we found. So there are about seven studies now that are um, available for this, for this analysis. There's only been one pre prior uh, meta-analysis a few years ago. This is the Greenwood paper that someone mentioned before. And there are sort of two results here. One is, these are the crude models. This is without taking into a confounding. And you can see that the rate ratio there is 1.79, statistically significant. When you get to the standardized relative risk estimate for the fully adjusted model across these seven studies, you get this result of 1.12, statistically significant 1.03 to 1.22. And the I squared, which is a calculation of the heterogeneity. This is statistical heterogeneity between those and among those studies. It's 36%, which basically means we can argue that it's, they're not heterogeneous, at least from a statistical perspective. Anyone who knows anything about causality assessment would say that that 1.12 qualifies as a very weak association. This is the dose-response uh, analysis from those same um, seven prospective studies. Here's that same result up here that you saw before for the fully adjusted models. This is highest versus lowest. I should have been ASB, not SSB. Um, 1.12, that's what you saw before. Now, this is interesting, and this is important because we're basically not seeing a dose-response relationship. So if you look at the never or rarely category here, and compare it to monthly uh, consumption of artificially sweetened beverages, or weekly or daily, and these are the five, five, or six studies, you see here that the relative risk estimate is basically the same, whether it's statistically significant or not. And we do have one sort of high level of heterogeneity over there. But this, this result here is actually very critical because it basically shows that there's no dose response relationship between the consumption of artificially sweetened beverages and the risk of type 2 diabetes in these seven prospective studies. Uh, let's just talk about heterogeneity for just a minute because I wanted to point out something that actually uh, Berna mentioned and I think is an important point here. There are two kinds of heterogeneity, and the kind that we've been talking about before, this one where we looked at these numbers over here, this is statistical heterogeneity. This is really a way to measure the extent to which the confidence intervals overlap. That's what it's measuring. There is this other type of heterogeneity. This is design heterogeneity, and that's what Berna was talking about. She was talking about differences in study design, whether that's the differences in the type of artificially, artificial sweetener you're talking about, or in the terms of number and types of confounders that are being evaluated in each study. There is no, at the present time, in today's methodology, there's no real objective way to evaluate design heterogeneity. We all know it's there. We just don't have an objective way of assessing it. Now, let me just give you a great example of design heterogeneity. When was the last time you saw animal studies and human studies being combined in a meta-analysis? You go, duck, <laughs> that's stupid. Why is that not done? It's a design heterogeneity problem. They're too different. If you collapse that idea down to say, well, but aren't there other less obvious differences between studies, more subtle differences between the studies, 
where does that, where do you then decide which studies to combine and which ones you don't? And this is an area of research that really uh, needs to be done because there's very little being done right now. There are two things I can think of. One is whether the exposure was the same or not. That's the artificially sweetened, which sweetener you're using. The other is which confounders were controlled for in the studies. That would be another way to uh, assess design heterogeneity. Publication bias. Now this is, this is actually very interesting too. You've probably all seen these, these diagrams, these funnel plots of, of publication bias. And this is the traditional way to look at publication bias for any meta-analysis. This is the what you do. You're basically in your head are saying, or in this model you're saying, if these results were randomly allocated by the process that things get published, would, what would this diagram look like, and is it statistically significant or not? That's the sort of approach that you take to publication bias. There is, however, a very different way to think about publication bias, and that is to say, are there other studies that have the data on, for example, artificially sweetened beverages and type 2 diabetes, but they haven't published that data? Now, whether it's biased or not is another question because I can't predict what those results would be. But in this particular instance, and this is, and I'll get to the conclusion here and then I'll stop in a minute. Um, there are at least 15 studies out there that have data on artificially sweetened beverages and type 2 diabetes. By the way, they also have data on sugar sweetened beverages and type 2 diabetes that have never been published. And you also, but so, so we're looking at this sort of universe, this sort of subset of the universe of, of existing data, the seven prospective studies that have been published, not really knowing what the other 15 studies would have to say about it. And I'm not going to predict it, but I will say that that is a different type of assessment of publication bias than the traditional view. I'm not suggesting not doing the traditional view. I'm just suggesting that there's another way of looking at it. So what do we conclude here? That and, and just to back up here, there, as I mentioned before, there was a one prior meta-analysis in 2014. I think there were four studies and now seven. Um, so the relationship as we see it today in this meta-analysis, it's weak associations that lack dose response. Whether the associations will be reduced further from confounding is unclear. If you remember, if you looked at the, at the, crude, uh, the crude relative risk was somewhere around 1.8. You put in the confounders, you get down to 1.12. That suggests that more confounding might be there. That's residual confounding. And then we have this uh, problem of the 15 studies that exist with unpublished data. And with that, I'll make some acknowledgments. These are my co-authors. Uh, additional support from Dr. Altice. And uh, again, uh, my comment about the Coca-Cola company. Thank you.